I want to remind everybody that the Scleroderma Foundation does not endorse any specific treatments, drugs, or research trials. And because scleroderma affects all patients differently, treatment approaches that may be appropriate for some patients may be less suitable for others. Any treatment decisions should be based on knowledgeable discussions between patients and their clinicians. And now I'd like to introduce our guest, Ed Harris. He is the founder and CEO of the Scleroderma Education Project, which is a nonprofit solely focusing on the systemic forms of scleroderma with a primary mission of education from basic information for patients and family to advanced information that can be useful to clinicians who are not scleroderma specialists. In addition, the Scleroderma Education Project is also advancing research that is focused in better understanding the early stages of the systemic scleroderma disease process with the hope that this might lead to new treatment approaches. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ed Harris. Thank you. Let me uh, attempt to share my screen here. Thank you. So thank you all for attending this talk. The topic of this talk is ANA and antibody testing in systemic sclerosis. In addition to covering the basics of ANA testing, we will also examine the role of ANA and antibody testing in systemic sclerosis diagnosis and treatment. When this talk is posted on YouTube, there will be a link to the handout version of the presentation that will include detailed notes that you can refer to later. This is a complex topic, and I suspect that some of this will be a little tricky to understand when you first hear it. So going back to the handout, handout should be helpful. Uh, one important disclaimer, some of the information presented here is US focused and may not be completely applicable in other countries where different testing methods are routinely used. About seven years ago, I started writing a series of articles about ANA and antibody testing. What led to my doing this was frequently seeing two types of comments in patient uh, support groups that concerned me. This is the first type of comment. In many cases, when a clinician says something like this, correct diagnosis may be delayed for several years. This type of comment is even more concerning. After the patient goes home in total shock, she will probably do a Google search for diffuse scleroderma, where she will learn that she has a horrible fatal disease and has only about five years to live. By the end of this talk, my goal is for you to understand exactly why both of these comments may be completely incorrect and should never be uttered by clinicians. Before we start learning about ANA and antibody testing, I want to emphasize that systemic sclerosis is a clinical diagnosis supported by lab tests, not the other way around. This is the most important slide in this entire presentation. Antinuclear antibodies are a type of antibody that attack the nucleus of a cell. These types of antibodies are usually, but not always, present in autoimmune disorders such as lupus, Sjogren's, or systemic sclerosis. Correctly done ANA testing is very helpful in formally diagnosing systemic sclerosis. More than 90% of patients will have a positive ANA when ANA testing is done correctly. While sometimes very challenging to do, in most patients, it is possible to, to identify the specific antibody that leads to a positive ANA result. As will be discussed shortly, correct antibody identification can be very helpful to the clinician by suggesting potential risks and complications as well as having a role in developing the best possible treatment plan for the individual patient. The gold standard method for doing ANA testing is called indirect immunofluorescence and is commonly abbreviated IFA or IIF. It is a time-consuming manual process. An ANA test done by IFA can detect the presence of up to 150 different antibodies, but does not tell you which specific antibody or antibodies were detected. 
The main two results of an ANA IFA test are called pattern and titer. Pattern is the way the antibodies appear on the slide, and titer is a measure of the level of antibodies in the blood. The higher the titer, the higher the likelihood that the result is significant. This is in part because a significant number of people in the general population, especially older people, have low positive ANA titers that do not appear to be associated with any disease. The titer number indicates the degree to which the patient's blood sample can be diluted and still produce recognizable staining. In the US, initial testing is typically done with a dilution of 40 to one and is written as a two-part number such as one colon 40. If no staining pattern is visible at this initial 40 to one dilution level, the ANA result is negative. However, if a staining pattern is seen, the dilution is doubled and the technician again looks for a visible staining pattern. This means that possible ANA titers follow a pattern, always starting at one to 40 and then doubling. So higher ANA titers are one to 80, one to 160, one to 320, one to 640, et cetera. Patients post comments like this all the time in support groups. It is important to understand that normal testing variance for ANA titers is plus or minus one titer level. This means that if your real ANA titer is one to 160, ANA IFA testing of the same blood sample is likely to sometimes show a result of either one to 80 or one to 320 in addition to the expected one to 160 result. In this example, the one to 160 and one to 320 ANA titers are considered to be the same. In contrast, if the ANA titer had changed from one, uh, one to 80 to one to 640, that would be considered a significant change in titer level. <clears throat> In addition to the titer, a positive ANA IFA also has a staining pattern. The four main types of staining patterns seen in systemic sclerosis patients are speckled, homogeneous, nucleolar, and centromere, and these are universally reported. However, there is limited agreement among laboratories as to which additional ANA staining patterns should be identified and reported to clinicians. Therefore, it is recommended that a positive ANA IFA test should always be followed up by detailed specific antibody testing. The exact type of antibody testing depends on the patient's symptom profile. So if the clinician suspects lupus, they would order a different antibody panel than if they suspect systemic sclerosis. <clears throat> One final note on ANA staining patterns. <clears throat> As noted earlier, ANA IFA testing can detect the presence of up to 150 different antibodies. Of note, one staining pattern, centromere, is highly correlated with the presence of centromere antibodies. In fact, many research papers use a centromere staining pattern as sufficient criteria for indicating that the patient has centromere antibodies. However, some experts suggest that even with an ANA IFA centromere staining pattern and a clinical profile consistent with centromere antibodies, a follow-up centromere antibody test should always be done to verify the staining pattern. <clears throat> Just to complicate things, it is not uncommon to see ANA IFA results showing two and occasionally three separate ANA titers and staining pattern as in this real example. <clears throat> what this means is that more than one antibody has been detected by the ANA IFA test. Detailed antibody testing will often show which antibodies triggered this result. <clears throat> <clears throat> In recent years, the standard method of doing ANA testing has started to change. Three alternative ways of doing ANA testing are now commonplace solid phase immunoassays, ELISA or EIA, line immunoassays, LIA, or a related technique known as multiplex beta ray. 
These new methods are faster, cheaper, and are generally very accurate. Unfortunately, they also introduce significant major problems, especially for patients with systemic sclerosis. A few slides ago, I mentioned that ANA testing by IFA detects the presence of up to 150 different antibodies, but doesn't tell you specifically which ones. In contrast, ELISA, LIA, and multiplex assays test for a limited number of specific antibodies, typically 12 or fewer. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> if you happen to have one of the antibodies included in the ANA screening panel, the test will reliably detect it. Most ANA panels are focused on the more common autoimmune diseases, primarily lupus and Sjogren's, and they do a very good job of detecting the antibodies typically seen in these diseases. However, when it comes to systemic sclerosis, it is a very different story. Because ANA screening panels sometimes miss antibodies for rare diseases, in 2011, the American College of Rheumatology issued a position statement recommending that initial ANA screening for the presence of autoimmune diseases should always be done by ANA IFA testing, especially the patient's symptom profile doesn't suggest a specific disease. However, if the ANA panel is focused on a specific disease, screening by solid phase assays is often as accurate as ANA IFA testing, and in some cases can actually detect antibodies that may be missed by ANA IFA testing in rare cases, as will be discussed later. So if, uh, if systemic sclerosis is the suspected diagnosis and ANA IFA testing is positive, detailed antibody testing is the next step. So let's go back 30 years for a moment. In 1990, only two antibodies, SCL70 and Centromere, were commonly screened for in cases of suspected systemic sclerosis, although researchers had identified other antibodies that were systemic sclerosis specific, such as RNA polymerase three and U3RNP. <clears throat> One key difference between patients with SCL70 and centromere antibodies is the degree of skin involvement. SCL70 positive patients tend to have diffuse skin involvement potentially involving most of the body. In contrast, in patients with centromere antibodies who have skin involvement, the body areas are more limited, typically only affecting the face and lower limbs, hands up to the elbows, feet up to the knees, but not areas like the trunk or upper limbs. A third related disease, mixed connective tissue disease, MCTD, as it's commonly abbreviated, was also identified. MCTD includes many symptoms seen in systemic sclerosis, but also symptoms commonly seen in lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and myositis. MCTD is associated with U1 RNP antibodies, typically with a very high speckled ANA titer. <clears throat> Fast forward to today. Now, most researchers include about 10 antibodies in the systemic sclerosis family of diseases, and things are much more complicated. Most of the antibodies tend to fit nicely into three general categories, diffuse, limited, or overlap syndrome. But while patients with U3 RNP antibodies tend to develop diffuse skin changes, several studies have shown that this is not universal. And in the case of one of the newer discovered antibodies, U11, U12 RNP, about half the patients have diffuse and half have limited skin changes. Let's look at the antibody prevalence rates in this table. If you just look at the three most common antibodies, centromere, SCL70, and RNA polymerase three, this represents only 60 to 70% of the overall systemic sclerosis patient population. All general ANA screening panels that I'm aware of in the US include a CL70. Some add centromere and occasionally U1 RNP, but none include RNA polymerase three antibodies, 
which are actually about as common as SCL70 antibodies. This means that depending on which antibodies are included in the ANA panel, if the patient has systemic sclerosis, between 50 and 70% of the time, a general ANA panel will have a negative result. And that leads to comments like this. Initial ANA screening for a suspected autoimmune disease is often done by a primary care clinician. In many medical facilities, when a clinician orders an ANA test, what is done is an ANA screening panel done by either ELISA or multiplex testing rather than ANA IFA testing. As you've just learned, general ANA screening panels commonly used in the US miss systemic sclerosis antibodies up to 70% of the time. Since many primary care clinicians have no formal training in these complex ANA testing issues, it is not uncommon for an untrained clinician to incorrectly interpret a negative ANA panel result as indicating that the patient does not have any antibodies and therefore is very unlikely to have an autoimmune disease. Over the years, we have learned that while patients vary widely on an individual basis, each antibody has its own unique clinical disease associations and specific risk profiles. This can be very important for managing patients. For example, patients with RNA polymerase three antibodies have a very high risk for developing scleroderma renal crisis, up to 35% in some studies. Because of this, these patients should monitor their blood pressure daily, looking for a sudden spike in blood pressure that persists for several hours, as this can be a leading indicator of developing scleroderma renal crisis. In addition, patients with RNA polymerase three antibodies should generally not be treated with other than very low doses of prednisone, as higher doses can trigger scleroderma renal crisis. In contrast, prednisone is often used to treat patients with some of the overlap syndromes, for example, mixed connective tissue disease, since the risks of developing scleroderma renal crisis are very low in these diseases. <clears throat> One area where systemic sclerosis patients are often confused is whether there is any clinical significance to their ANA and antibody level. For example, does the fact that their ANA titer is 1 to 1280 mean that they have a more active disease or more severe disease than someone who has an ANA titer of 1 to 160? In some cases, it can be the exact opposite. If you do a Google search for this question, you will quickly find that respected resources such as Medscape indicate that in patients with systemic sclerosis, ANA titers are not at all correlated with disease activity or severity. Therefore, there is usually no clinical need to repeat ANA and specific antibody testing once the levels have been established. While this may be true in general, at least in the case of SEL70 antibodies, there are a few papers that suggest the opposite, although the, research, although the research has been mixed. A study published in 2003 showed a positive correlation between total skin thickness scores and antibody levels in a group of 11 patients with SCL70s. They also found that when antibody levels changed in eight of, these, of the 11 patients, these changes correlated with changes in skin thickness scores. A more recent and much larger study also found significantly positive correlations between antibody levels and total skin thickness scores. However, antibody levels did not correlate with other measures of disease severity, such as lung inv involvement in any of these studies. Earlier, I mentioned that patients are sometimes concerned that since they have very high ANA titers, this might be a bad sign, since many other people seem to have much lower ANA titers, often in the 1 to, uh, 1 to 80 to 1 to 320 range. There is very little published data in the research literature on typical ANA titers for various systemic sclerosis specific antibodies. As I mentioned earlier, U1 RNP antibodies, which are associated with mixed connective tissue disease, are known 
to typically have high ANA titers. All six patients in a recent study of patients with a rare THTO antibody had ANA titers of 1 to 1280. Systemic sclerosis patients with THTO antibodies are generally classified as limited, although with a very different overall disease profile than patients with centromere antibodies. A recent informal self-report survey of 144 systemic sclerosis patients conducted by this author recently showed that ANA titers for patients with centromere antibodies were significantly higher than patients with SCL70 antibodies. Centromere antibodies were mostly associated with ANA titers of 1 to 1280 or higher, while SCL70 associated ANA titers were typically 1 to 320 or lower. We did not have a large enough number of respondents with RNA polymerase 3 antibodies to reach statistical significance, but average ANA titers for patients with this antibody were generally between the titer levels of patients with SCL70 and centromere antibodies in this informal survey, at least. The key takeaway here is that while it does appear to be the case that some systemic sclerosis specific antibodies tend to have higher or lower average ANA titers, the variability is very high for all antibodies and generally has little correlation with the disease activity or severity. This is also a common post. There are a couple of reasons why this can occur. In most cases, it is due to a change in testing method. So let's assume that the earlier ANA test was done by IFA and you are positive for RNA polymerase three antibodies. If your new doctor reorders an ANA test without specifying ANA IFA, there is a very good chance that a general screening panel will be done by one of the solid phase assays that tests for a limited number of antibodies. In this case, the ANA panel result will almost certainly be negative since it's very unlikely that RNA polymerase three will be included in that panel. While less frequent than the change in testing methods, in some cases, this can also occur with a very low positive ANA titer such as one to 40. Some labs use a 1 to 40 cutoff for a low positive, and others a 1 to 80 cutoff. In Europe, I will often see 1 to 160 as a cutoff. In, if your previous ANA titer was 1 to 40, and you retest at a lab with a 1 to 80 cutoff, and again have the same 1 to 40 titer, the new lab would report this as a negative result. Several recent studies have documented that about 5% of patients with formally diagnosed systemic sclerosis are ANA negative when testing is done by IFA. The question is why? A 2013 paper indicates that while rare, patients with KU, PMSEL, and even RNA polymerase 3 antibodies can sometimes be ANA IFA negative. When this occurs, retesting at a different lab that uses a different ANA IFA testing kit often would yield a positive ANA IFA result. Our UV BL1 slash 2 antibodies are a newly identified systemic sclerosis specific antibody that are present in about 2% of systemic sclerosis patients. It is classified as an overlap syndrome antibody. A recent paper noted that RUVBL12 antibodies can be ANA IFA negative. Other rare antibodies such as U11, U12 RNP can also be ANA IFA negative. Another newly identified systemic sclerosis specific antibody abbreviated ELF2B is actually not an anti-nuclear antibody, but rather an anti-cytoplasmic antibody. Anti-cytoplasmic antibodies do not attack the nucleus of the cell. And while these are detectable in an ANA IFA test, some labs do not report cytoplasmic staining patterns. 
It is important to note that currently not all researchers accept ELF2B as a systemic sclerosis specific antibody. Also, there is no published data as to what the overall prevalence rate is for this antibody. Although a 2018 study found that seven out of 128 ANA IFA negative patients with a formal systemic sclerosis diagnosis had ELF2B antibodies. A false positive lab result means that the test result is positive when it should have been negative. While there are occasionally false positive or false negative testing issues with many lab tests, according to recent research, SCL70 antibody testing appears to have a major problem with false positive results. Historically, SCL70 antibody testing <clears throat> was mostly done by a technique called double immunodiffusion, usually abbreviated ID. This is considered to be the most reliable SCL70 antibody testing method. However, ID testing is time consuming and expensive. Because of this, almost all labs have switched to testing for SCL70 antibodies using one of the solid phase assays such as ELISA multiplex or LIA. While SCL70 antibodies are considered to be highly specific to systemic sclerosis, a number of studies have documented that patients without a clear diagnosis of systemic sclerosis often test positive for SCL70 antibodies when testing is done by either ELISA or multiplex testing. This is sometimes seen in patients with a diagnosis of lupus. Notably, almost all of the positive SCL70 results in lupus patients are low positive. Some clinicians who are aware of the SCL70 false positive problem order repeat testing at the same lab thinking that this is just a testing precision issue. Unfortunately, this does not appear to be the case and repeat testing at the same lab is likely to continue to yield false positive results. <clears throat> Two recent papers have shed much more light on this important topic. A 2018 paper compared SEL te uh, SEL70 testing on a group of 129 patients by three different testing methods, multiplex, ELISA, and immunodiffusion. All of the patients in this group were positive by multiplex testing, but only 26% had a formal diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. When ELISA testing was added, only 51 patients were positive by both methods, and out of these 51, 45% had a formal systemic sclerosis diagnosis. When the ID testing was added to the ELISA testing, only 21 out of the original 129 patients were positive by all three methods. But more important, more than 90% of this group were formally diagnosed with systemic sclerosis, suggesting that ID testing is significantly more specific clinically than either of the other two testing methods. One interesting finding was that ELISA results that were five times higher than the normal range cutoff were highly correlated with a formal diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. Unfortunately, the study did not look at multiplex results to see if there was a similar pattern. The second recent study looked at 46 patients who tested positive for SCL70 antibodies by multiplex testing and correlated the value of the test result against a formal diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. Out of the 46 patients with a positive multiplex SCL70 antibody result, only 17, that's 37%, had a formal diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. More importantly, only highly elevated results were significantly correlated with the diagnosis. This is about five times the normal range cutoffs, similar to the findings in the study that I just mentioned. So if you look at both studies and just consider multiplex testing, between 63 and 75% of patients who were positive by multiplex testing were negative by the gold standard ID testing method. This suggests 
that the false positive SCL70 testing problem appears to be very common in routine clinical practice. However, it is also important to point out that since longitudinal follow-up studies have not been done, there's no way to know if some of these patients will eventually test positive using ID or other similar testing met uh, methodologies. So earlier we saw what can happen when a clinician doesn't fully understand ANA testing and interprets a negative ANA screening panel as indicating that the patient does not have an autoimmune disease, let alone systemic sclerosis. This is the other side of the coin. Here, the clinician suspects a possible underlying autoimmune disease, orders a general ANA screening panel that is typically done by multiplex or ELISA and gets a positive SCL70 result. As we just saw, in some cases, this is a false positive 70 result, typically a low positive. Unfortunately, many untrained clinicians believe that a positive antibody test means that the patient has systemic sclerosis, frequently leading to comments like this. We will learn about the role of ANA and antibody testing in diagnosing systemic sclerosis in the final part of this presentation. There are a number of different ways to, to determine if an SCL70 role is likely to be a false positive. The most reliable method is to retest at a lab that offers ID testing or another method that does not have the false positive problem seen with multiplex and ELISA testing. While no data has yet been formally published, I recently learned anecdotally that a new testing method called chemiluminescence yield virtually identical results to ID testing, but is less expensive and easier to do. I am pushing the researchers to publish the data, but no luck so far. If the results of an ANA IFA test are negative, this increases the likelihood that a positive SCL70 result is a false positive. However, there is an important caveat here. If the lab uses a 1 to 80 cutoff for ANA IFA testing, there is a possibility that an ANA IFA result reported as negative actually has a tighter 1 to 40. In this case, a low positive SCL70 result cannot be assumed to be a false positive. In most cases, systemic sclerosis patients test positive for only one uh, specific antibody. If the results of an ANA panel include a positive SCL70 result and a second positive systemic sclerosis specific antibody such as Centimere, this increases the chances that the SCL70 is a false positive. Interestingly, a few years ago, one major testing lab included a note on reports that showed more than one systemic sclerosis specific antibody stating that this was a rare occurrence and that the SCL70 was likely a false positive. While this is not a completely reliable method, retesting SCL70 at a different lab that uses a different testing method can sometimes be very helpful. If one of the two tests is negative, this strongly suggests that the positive result was a false positive. However, it is entirely possible to have a second false positive as we saw in the paper I mentioned just a little while ago. So formally diagnosing a patient with systemic sclerosis is often very challenging, even for an experienced systemic sclerosis specialist. In the final part of this talk, I want to briefly discuss the role of ANA and antibody testing in clinical diagnosis. In 2013, the American College of Rheumatology and the European League Against Rheumatism approved a new set of classification criteria for systemic sclerosis, replacing the older 1980 criteria. These criteria use a nine point scale with clear indications as to what signs and symptoms count towards the nine point total. As you can see in this chart, the three most common systemic sclerosis specific antibodies are included, centromere, SCL70, and RNA polymerase 3, but none of the rarer ones are included. If you look closely, several common symptoms are also missing from this table. 
For example, GI symptoms such as reflux, difficulty swallowing, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Also recall that these three common antibodies only account for 60 to 70% of diagnosed systemic sclerosis patients. So why are these common symptoms missing from this chart? It turns out that the abstract for the paper that introduced this new point chart omitted a very important point. And as a result, this chart is often misused by many clinicians who are not systemic sclerosis experts. If you read the actual paper, which in practice few people do, you quickly discover that the intended purpose of this classification chart is for selections of patients for formal research studies, not for formal clinical diagnosis. While the point chart can be used as part of clinical diagnosis, the clinician is supposed to also factor in additional signs and symptoms. For example, GI symptoms, tendon friction rubs, and even very specific uh, symptoms such as scleroderma renal crisis. So to bring us back to the main topic of this talk, ANA and antibodies in systemic sclerosis, consider a patient who has Renaud's, puffy fingers, abnormal nail fold capillaries, reflux, joint pain, and severe fatigue, but has a rare antibody such as U3RNP instead of one of the three antibodies included in the chart. Despite having many systemic sclerosis specific symptoms and an antibody that is disease specific, they only would have a total of seven points on this chart. A systemic sclerosis specialist would almost certainly diagnose a patient with systemic sclerosis given all of these signs and symptoms. Unfortunately, in practice, many untrained clinicians rigidly look for a total of nine points and if not there, refuse to formally diagnose the patient with systemic sclerosis, often giving the patient a tentative diagnosis such as undifferentiated connective tissue disease. This often leads to significant delays in correctly diagnosing a patient with systemic sclerosis, potentially delaying treatments that could slow down the course of the disease and failing to appropriately monitor for potential risk factors when following the patient clinically. To end this presentation, we return to our key slide. I hope you now have a better understanding of why I still consider this to be the most important slide in today's presentation. I would like to formally thank Drs. Marvin Fritzler, Alan Metzger, Alan Bridges, and John Weiss for their invaluable contributions by reviewing and greatly improving these slides. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. I know that's a very complicated um, slide presentation to try to get everybody to understand. And one of the things I like is that he gave everybody a handout. We're gonna be sending a final version, as I mentioned with our um, edited recording, and what you should all think about doing is just go through it at your leisure and have your um, printed handout and put notes as he's talking about little things. And, and that will have you, especially if you ever go to your appointments and you have questions for your physicians, take it with you. Uh, look at your labs, um, see some of the things that were done, um, some of the tests that were done a certain way that Ed talks about versus um, other ways. But um, while it gets a little confusing, I think that watching it again and making um, notes to yourself on the handout, I think will help you um, better understand and also be able to uh, speak to your um, medical professionals about it. And uh, my contact information is on the handout. And if you have specific questions, something you don't understand from the presentation, feel free to email me at any time. Thank you, Ed. Does anybody have any specific questions you want to type in the chat box? Uh, Lucy says, when I was first diagnosed 1987, I had a positive ANA. Can you see that, Ed? One in uh, 5,000? I'm not seeing, uh, uh, let's see, 5120, I would guess. I don't have the, I'm not seeing the notes or the, uh, the chat. Let me see if I can bring them up. Okay, got it. Yeah, that's there we go. Is that is that heard of? Heard oh, yeah. Of uh, yeah. Um, so I didn't go all the way, but the um, 
uh, in most labs, ANA titers top at 5120. And if, so I went up to 640, then 1280, 2560, and uh -huh. 5120. In my own case, my ANA titer uh, is 1280 plus or minus one titer level, exactly as most patients with centromere antibodies are, which is this survey I just did, this little informal survey was really quite interesting. Um, and it did confirm that um, what I have noticed over the years, I review several lab reports a day trying to interpret for people and answer questions. Um, and I had uh, actually noticed that especially uh, centromere antibodies were very rarely uh, at very low titers and kind of wondered about it. And one of the, one of the people who uh, did major improvements to this original slideshow, uh, Dr. Marvin Fritzler, who is um, a head of Mitogen Lab in Calgary, and he's the expert that the experts turn to if they have questions. Um, anyway, he first mentioned to me about three months ago that some antibodies are naturally low titer and some are naturally high titer. And the reason is not known. And I was certainly aware that U1 RNP antibodies, mixed connective tissue disease, are almost always quite high. And in 5120 is not that uncommon with U1 RNP. Uh, and that typically others like SCL70 were lower titer. Um, until I did the research, I actually hadn't seen this paper that TH2O antibodies are also high titer, at least in this one study. So it's interesting. I didn't say this in it, but one of the ways this can be useful for clinicians, um, and I'll probably put this in a clinician version of this presentation. If you have a situation where you've got a uh, positive, uh, especially a low positive SCL70, um, and a very high titer ANA IFA, and especially if the symptom profile doesn't match what you would typically see with SCL70, that could be used as kind of a red flag to say, well, maybe we should be testing some other antibodies which we didn't test for the first time around. And so that's a useful aspect of knowing that titers you know, can be lower or higher. And I will say, I saw a very low, a few very low centimeter and a couple very high SCL70. But to be honest, I would wonder if some of the very high SCL70s we saw, uh, ANA titers might have been exactly that situation. Uh, we didn't look at confirmed or anything. It was just an informal survey for this presentation. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, and, and so in Lucy's case, um, she's kind of like what you were talking about. She had the super high ANA, but then her SCL70 was negative. So she says, is that good? Well, what uh, is the combination of a high ANA at that level and an SCL70 uh, certainly suggests the presence of an underlying autoimmune disease. That's certainly the case with anybody with a significantly positive ANA. Um, but again, these are nonspecific. And so just of the three that I've mentioned today, uh, Centromere, U1 RNP, and THTO um, commonly have quite high ANA titers. And you certainly weren't tested for those back then. Uh, or Centromere, you might have been, but, uh, but that is a consideration. And, um, and people are still confused by the idea that, well, SCL70 is scleroderma antibody. And just to make that more confusing, at least I think this finally changed, but up till a few years ago, uh, the LabCorp SCL70 antibody test was called scleroderma antibody. And so a clinician who doesn't have training tested the scleroderma antibody and it was negative. So clearly you don't have it. I think that's long since changed, but when I first started studying this stuff, that was in fact the case. And um, there is a lot of confusion on it, but remember I've listed 10, maybe 11 antibodies. Eight of the 10 uh, can easily be tested for in the US. The other two newer ones, U1112 and the RUVBL12, you can actually test for those in Canada, but you can't in the US at any commercial lab. Thank you, Ed. Um, 
Roberta asks, thanks, Ed, great presentation. How often do you recommend we get antibody testing done? Um, after it has been identified, assuming it fits the clinical profile, never again. In fact, um, one of the things I just did myself two years ago, out of curiosity, I said, I haven't had ANA or antibody testing in 25 years, just curious to see if it's changed. So I decided to have those retested. And I knew um, I would have to pay out of pocket because that was not medically necessary. Huh. And my ANA and antibody body levels were identical what they were when I was first diagnosed in 1990. And that is mostly the case. Um, one paper I uh, didn't talk about, it was in an earlier draft that was kind of interesting. Uh, some research has been done following what happens to ANA levels and antibody levels in patients who have autologous stem cell transplants, where in cases where that's successful, theoretically may actually be a complete cure. And what happens, it takes a little bit, but ANA uh, titers do drop quite a bit, but they don't go away. And often when, when patients relapse, they'll see the titers go back up to where uh, they were in the baseline. That was getting a little esoteric for this talk, so I left it out. But, um, but yeah, the um, SCL70 is the only one where there may in fact be some correlation, but it's important to think about the fact that if it doesn't make a difference clinically in how you are being treated, there really is no reason to retest once you have solid, uh, believable results. I, I think that's the key is um, believable, solid, believable results. As you're, you're bringing out this presentation, people might find that they had some of these labs done um, by um, not as um, specific in specialty uh, lab testing, um, the the specific testing for antibodies that you're talking about. And while it might be a little difficult to understand, people will research that. And I guess, would you say then those are the ones that might be interested in um, having it retested under the circumstances because they've done mm -hmm. the research and they've, they see for themselves that it could be um, possibly, um, I don't want to say a misdiagnosis. That's not the right word. I can't think of what I'm trying to say. Um, well, I, it's important to remember that in many, many, many cases, but not all, uh, just because the SCL70 is a false positive doesn't mean you don't have systemic sclerosis. In, in most cases, it just means you haven't identified the antibody yet. And there are certainly the cases in which I cited here of the general screening panel, which randomly comes up with a false positive SCL70 and the doctor, I had actually, I reviewed a lab report two weeks ago for a patient where the doctor literally said, you have, to, uh, the only thing that they had was a low positive SCL70 and the patient was told you have diffuse scleroderma. And I calmed her down pretty quickly and I'm, I'm sure she went back with a little more armed for better testing. But these examples I see all the time. Agree. Um, so the question, um, I'll, I'll go over this first. Um, when monitoring blood pressure for spike with RNA P3, how much of a spike is considered significant enough to contact doctor or ER? Okay, I can answer that one. Um, I, there was a very good talk and I can't remember who gave it three years ago at the annual conference, which I followed up with some other discussions uh, with other people. And basically the res what I got was if let's assume you are monitoring on a daily basis, which actually a lot of patients now do, and more and more doctors are telling patients to do this, I'm pleased to see. Um, if you monitor every day, the same time of day and conditions is the best way to get a clear baseline. If you do that and you see a sudden spike of 30 or more points on the first measure, it's called systolic, that's enough for you to go into, um, let's see what's going on four or five hours later mode. Um, interestingly, in the conference before that, one of the doctors said, you know, check it, wait and check it the next day. I asked that at the, at the conference the set next year, and this doctor said, no, don't wait till the next day. Do four or five hours later, if it is still at that level, 
and it's most of the time both numbers will be up but I actually play uh, bassoon in a community orchestra and the uh, it's a medical school orchestra and the uh, uh, player next to me uh, happens to be head of um, uh, renal at UW and I asked him about this and he said you really can just look at the first number because the second will typically follow. So if you see a sudden spike, 30 points or more, and four or five hours later, it has not changed, he said, call your doctor or what clinic or whatever, uh, even if it's a holiday weekend. This is not one where you wait a few days because a few days later, you may be in danger of losing your kidneys. It is called scleroderma renal crisis for a reason. Yes. Thank you, Ed. Um, Bonnie says, thank you, Ed. I'm a support group leader and would like to hear your best advice for us to give a patient newly diagnosed at a non-specialist office and confused by his or her test. So any of you who follow my posts in any of the dozen or so Facebook groups I'm in, the first thing I always do, and most uh, group leaders do exactly the same thing is say, your best option, as soon as systemic sclerosis is even suspected, either based on symptom profile or preliminary lab tests, is to get a referral to a scleroderma specialist. And often people will note they're not near a specialist. And oh, the first thing to note is that if you go to the Scleroderma Foundation website, scleroderma.org, they have a list of scleroderma centers around the country. And that's where I send people. Uh, what a lot of people end up doing, if they're not really near, um, they may, once they can get a referral, if it's needed, they may arrange for a one-time visit to a specialist. That specialist will then coordinate with your general rheumatologist on your care. This is a very, very common uh, treatment uh, approach that a lot of people use. And one of the things I'm going to do here is I am going to defend the ignorance of your general rheumatologist. So if you think of it this way, a general, I haven't cr crunched the numbers lately, but um, if you think about it, the number of systemic sclerosis patients, a typical general rheumatologist probably encounters in their entire career, that is a very small number. Because of this, a general rheumatologist really shouldn't be spending any of their valuable continuing education learning about systemic sclerosis. They should be spending it learning about lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's, all the things they routinely um, um, deal with. However, what they should also do is acknowledge they don't have the expertise and refer you to a specialist. So that's your best option. Thank you, Ed. Um, Wanda asked, I had an RNA polymerase 3 IgG AV test, which was negative, was 20. Negative is less than 20. Do you suggest I repeat this test in the future? Um, if you have a negative antibody test, um, the only circumstance where you would want to retest might be if you're in a situation where it appears that you're early in the disease. Let me give you an example. Um, sometimes somebody will present with uh, a condition where the clinician will order an ANA test. Yeah. They'll discover something there that's maybe quite low and it could be a low positive SCL70. In some cases, it'll be a false positive. In other cases, even if you have zero symptoms, it may be a true positive, but you're just very, very early in the disease. In reality, and there hasn't been a lot of research for very obvious reasons, your antibodies will turn positive before you have symptoms, most researchers believe. Um, we do not know in what way the antibodies cause the disease symptoms to develop the majority of researchers assume that the antibodies are involved significantly in the disease process. But I mean, in contrast to lupus where they actually know the entire sequence or thyroid disease where they know exactly what goes on, they don't. So if you wanna be very a stickler here, um, formally I was told by uh, a colleague uh, 
we actually can't formally say that systemic sclerosis is an autoimmune disease. It almost certainly is, but until we fully understand how it works, you know, you, you can't do that. But what happens is, uh, uh, most researchers believe, is that the antibodies will initially be low, and eventually you'll start having symptoms, but at, for a while the antibody levels will go up, but then they, in gen they will stabilize, and then you don't really need to retest. So if you want to ask so my question is, if you have a negative RNA polymerase three, uh, do you have a positive ANA IFA test that goes with that? If you do, and you have symptoms suggestive of systemic sclerosis, any variant, then what I would do is not retest that one, but make sure you start testing for as many of the other antibodies uh, that you can. And I should note that I am working, I have a few patients that I've worked with, one I'm actively working with, who have formal diagnoses of systemic sclerosis, diffuse in one case, and has been tested for all 10 antibodies. I arranged to have testing done in Canada for her. And um, sometimes we do not know what antibody that people have. Now, uh, the case where you have positive ANA IFA and a clear clinical diagnosis and eight antibodies that you can easily test for are negative still leaves, um, you know, if you crunch the numbers, I don't know, 10% of people uh, who might have when uh, um, U1112 RNP is two to 3% of patients, uh, RUV BL1 and 2, that's another 2%. If you assume that the uh, ELFTB is a, an antibody, eh, might be another two. Anyway, you can see that um, there should be a significant number of people who clearly have systemic sclerosis, which is a clinical diagnosis, have a positive ANA IFA, but are negative for especially the top, uh, the top eight that you can test for in the US. But as I say, I've dealt with uh, at least two patients one of those is actually on therapeutic plasma exchange. Uh, and we literally do not know what antibody she has, uh, but her diagnosis is solid. Yeah, and, and I do realize that sometimes it takes a, a scleroderma specialist to help determine the diagnosis when some of these antibody testing are negative because um, it takes somebody that really understands some of the physical uh, things that they can see to help identify that. And you were going over the, the point system in, in your slides that help determine that. Um, but I, we, we all realize that that um, that can be very tricky sometimes with even the specialists because your, your tests are coming out negative and they're having to rely on some of the, the visual things that they're seeing or, or um, other side effects that you're telling them about, um, as Ed mentioned, and some that aren't even in there, like GI involvement, for example. One thing that I like to mention when I send people to specialists is one of the arguments for doing this is that a scleroderma center should be able to do a nail fold capillary exam. That's two points right there on that trusty chart if it is positive. And I have yet to hear of anybody who, uh, a rheumatologist who has a system for testing that. Ironically, um, I own one of those and it costs under $600. So the fact that your rheumatology office doesn't have one probably means they think that they still cost $10,000, which they used to. And there are some super high video capture systems which are much more sophisticated and are extremely sensitive. But the key point here is when you're, uh, this is a little bit getting off topic, but um, when your general rheumatologist looks at your nail full capillaries, which many do, they typically will use a handheld scope, 10 to 20 magnification. And if they see that your nail fall capillaries are abnormal, which they may do, there's your two points in the chart. On the other hand, if they don't see anything abnormal, all they can say is, I don't see anything abnormal, but I don't have high enough magnification to declare that your capillaries are normal. And this is important. So if you have a doctor who uses a handheld scope, and says, nope, your capillaries are normal. The first question to ask them would be what magnification level and in very, very few exceptions, it's like 20X or less. 
And what the research shows is you need 40X or higher up to 200X to really be able to, uh, to declare that the capillaries are normal. Abnormal, you can do with a naked eye in some cases, but you can't go the other way around. And I'm sorry, because that is off topic. That's okay. I'm actually picturing some of us um, at going into the office to see the, their, their physician and asking, I think they'll, it'll blow their mind that our, um, our members are so um, skilled in understanding this stuff. And that's what sometimes is necessary because not everybody gets to see a scleroderma specialist on top of that. So um, I actually appreciate you bringing that up. Um, is there any other questions from anybody? How important are KU antibodies for the course of the disease? I have high positive KU, but they are tested without titer nowadays, just positive or negative. Yeah, that's an interesting question. It's not uh, the first time I've heard that. Um, so KU antibodies are one of the rare antibodies in the systemic sclerosis family of diseases. It is one of the associated with one of the overlap syndrome. And actually KU is included routinely in uh, people are complaining of muscle issues. They do what are called myositis panels and KU is always included in that. I have been trying for years to convince the labs to also include KU as part of the, uh, the uh, detailed systemic sclerosis antibody panel, but so far nobody's doing that. So uh, what I typically suggest that when patients are getting testing, um, have the doctor order KU as an add-on if ANA IFA is positive, the other seven antibodies are negative and consistent with the symptoms. But KU is an overlap syndrome the core features are what you would expect in uh, any systemic sclerosis variants, but there's more muscle involvement than you would typically see uh, if you had like centromere or, or SEL70. And this is again, I, I do not know what the titer level is on KU because I had, I think, two people with it on my little survey and there's nothing published that I've seen. Um, positive or negative, assuming there's no issues with false positive or false negatives that I don't know about. Um, if you're positive, that's all that's relevant. And again, uh, out of these 10 antibodies, it's rare, it's like under 2% have more than one for real have more than one antibody. And the SCL70 false positive issue, of course, confuses things. But um, so if you have KU, the odds are very good. You won't have any of the other nine. And you should just assume you're dealing with uh, an overlap syndrome. No need to retest if it's, you know, if it's a clear positive. And, and Michael, he, he's um, in uh, Germany. So we were talking a little bit how some tests are different in other places. Could that also play a role with what you're mentioning? Well, yeah, back um, again, one of the key reviewers here is in Canada and um, uh, Mitogen Labs and the head of Mitogen Labs in Calgary. And they, aside from offering uh, the U1112 and the RUVBL1 and 2, use some very advanced essay, uh, assays to do some of their testing. And uh, when, when, the, when Dr. Frickler was uh, reviewing my initial slides, he brought up a lot of things which I realized were just, uh, what he was saying, of course, was correct. But what I was saying was correct in the US, which is why I added the comments that a lot of my things are US focused. When I look at antibody results from Europe and Australia, I actually find one, uh, a tighter of one to 160 is the common cutoff in many of these places. So anything I said where you get like gray areas where, you know, you're, I, I like to um, uh, use air quotes for your ANA IFA was negative um, because if your cutoff is 160 and you have a 140 tighter, 140 tighter or 1 to 80 tighter, those are labeled as negative. But once you're in the 180 camp, especially, you know, at least in the U.S., most people will, will consider that highly suspicious of being legitimately positive. Now, I mentioned that if you go grab a bunch of especially geriatric patients off the street after they quit protesting, uh, 
uh, um, you would and do ANA testing, you'd discover that a significant portion, I can't remember the number, uh, like 10% or more would be, have a titer of one to, uh, to 40. And a smaller number, but like maybe two or 3%, don't hold me to those percentages, uh, would be a 180 titer. One to 160 is getting to where you really are unlikely to have that. And one of the things that's speculated is that all these geriatric, especially people who have a one to 80 titer, maybe they're in the earliest stages of developing a future autoimmune disease that they might see in 10, 20 years. But at that point, they're asymptomatic, they have no disease. And so these slightly positive uh, ANA titers um, really are just something you see and don't have clinical significance. So that's why some of the variability on the testing, but if you've got a 160 titer, now you've got more, you know, the, the, um, your ANA IFA was negative, but your SCL 70 is positive. That little test for seeing that your SCL 70 is probably a false positive gets much weaker because I saw a fair number of one to 80 le legitimate titers when I was doing my little survey uh, for SCL 70. Uh, so, you know, you're getting into gray areas when, uh, when this occurs. Um, uh, there was a question, what is KU? Well, it's just um, these antibodies have, I literally do not have any idea what KU stands for. I can certainly find out with a quick uh, Google search, which is what I would do too. Um, and you'll discover it has something to do with some part of the nucleus of the cell. I mean, uh, if, the minute you start getting into this area, things get really esoteric really quickly. Yeah, we'll but it is that. just the name of an antibody associated with one of the overlap syndromes. The other sort of similar, not totally clinically, but sort of similar is called PM-SCL. The PM stands for polymyositis. Um, and that is an antibody that also has overlap of yeah. a lot of systemic sclerosis symptoms and more myositis, muscle involvement. So there's, and I cannot for the life of me uh, remember the fine details on what's different between KU and um, PMSCL in general. They're both considered on average, certainly less severe than patients with uh, diffuse antibodies and things like that. Uh, but, um, but, but they do, do have this profile called an overlap profile because most patients with uh, like pure forms of systemic sclerosis, centromere, you know, they may have a lot of joint pain, fatigue, those are pretty common, but actual muscle weakness is something that can occur, but that's not listed as a common symptom that many people have with the sort of more typical pure antibodies. When you get the overlap syndrome, you definitely see more muscle involvement. Yeah, I was just gonna say that. That's, what, that's why they do these um, tests to confirm these overlaps, because a lot of times we see different forms of myositis in scleroderma patients, which leads to my next question. What is on the myositis panel? That will vary from lab to lab, and I do not have expertise in screening for myositis, so I won't answer that other than to say, if you go to LabCorp and Quest, which are the two main lab chains in the U.S., do a search on their website. They'll have something called a test catalog, and do a search for myositis panel. That will very quickly, you will find a list of what antibodies are included. KU will be, PMSCL typically will be, and there will be some other antibodies that I have no clue what they are all about. My focus is uh, and expertise is very narrow and I do not have expertise in the myositis family, which is separate myositis family of diseases. So I don't comment outside my areas of knowledge. Thank you, Ed, appreciate that. Any uh, more questions before we finish up? I think we're good to go, Ed. Great. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to do this. And, you know, if you all don't un un know this, um, he's in Wisconsin.
So, and he had another talk earlier this morning before he, he came aboard with us. So um, I want you to know how much we really appreciate you uh, taking time out of your schedule to present this and help educate all of us on understanding these um, antibody testing. So thank you, Ed, very much. Uh,